Hey everybody, we're doing a live uh, Balticon interview. We haven't done one just like this ever. This is the first one where we've done like video, like a live video one. Like yeah, this. on location at the con. We haven't done these in a well, long time. Yeah. So uh, we were we were talking with our good buddy Jack Clemens, and he said you gotta get you gotta get Jim on the show. And 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 uh, or, well, actually no no, it started out with me approaching Jim at a panel because he was talking about um, a nuclear energy, and I've been trying to get someone on to talk about nuclear energy for a long time because I'm a big fan of it. Uh, I think it's very misunderstood in the uh, in, in the layman's world. I think a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about uh, its role and, and its you know the the merits and the flaws of, of using um, nuclear energy for power. Um, so so I approached Jim and he he considered it and then and then that's when Jack kind of talked him into it. I think a little bit. Yeah, I trust Jack. Yeah, I may regret that, but. <laughs> Yeah, you might. Thanks, <laughs> Jack. Thanks. So anyway, um, so so Jim, Jim has a, a BS in math, an MBA, and he's a PE. That's a professional engineer, if any of you all don't know what that means. It's a big deal. Uh, has been a nuclear engineer for over 40 years, a war gamer for over 50. There you go, Jonathan Reinhardt. Pay attention. Uh, an avid science fiction reader for even longer. His experience began as a naval officer aboard the USS Long Beach CGN-9. Uh, then design, construction, inspection, and assessment with nu with a nuclear utility. Nuclear. I say nuclear. I'm sorry. I've been trying to get over that. Um, so if I if I say it, please. I'm working on it. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear Regulatory Commission, U.S. NRC assignments included senior resident inspector and policy assistant for reactors to three different U.S. NRC commissioners, uh, earning the agency's material. Meritus and Distinguished Service Awards duties include research into alternative and speculative energy, which is really cool. I definitely want to touch on that just a little bit, uh, including coal, oil, hydro, geothermal, tidal, solar, wind, fracking, space-based, heavy water reactors, breeder reactors, fusion, and even antimatter. Uh, these studies were a necessary aspect for reviewing energy proposal, assessing technical reports, and drafting speeches. JBIS and Bain Books have published several of his nonfiction articles. So, Jim, welcome to the Mythwits. We're happy to have it you. It is great to be here, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> it will be. It will be. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is that, that you wrote about this in one of your Bain articles. I haven't had a chance to read it yet because we just set this up last night. But uh, you talked about how the, the history of the energy grid, because I think it's important to people, they, they get an idea of how, uh, we're going to talk about nuclear energy, so how does nuclear energy fit into the whole picture of the energy grid? Well, as we talked about last night, the, the grid has been called the supreme engineering achievement of the 20th century. Although it started in 1882 when Thomas Edison threw a switch, uh, which brought power to 59 customers in lower Manhattan, the switch was in J.P. Morgan's office, his primary investor, and he chose those places because he needed the funding he was going to get from the uh, various investment companies and financial firms where he was providing power, and also he needed the publicity from the New York Times to which he was already providing power. And the grid would grow thereafter as soon as electricity became more and more available, and as Edison's continued to develop his, his power plants, he had to find ways to get new customers, so he brought in elephants. Elephants, okay. Elephants. See, P.T. Barnum had brought in Jumbo, the elephant, about oh, a few months earlier, under great fanfare, had dragged it all the way through in a big box, drawn by horses and pushed by other elephants, all the way down Broadway and all the way to Madison Square Garden, and, and it had been exhibited for the previous four months, selling out the selling out all it shows at over 10,000 people each. This is, remember now, this is 1882, 83 time frame. Right. And so he realized he needed the PR. So he named his dynamo that he was providing the power with the Jumbo Dynamo. Oh, God, okay. And so he continued to increase the amount of power he was generating. And various other stunts allowed him to open new power stations. But because he was using DC power, he had to have a power station every half mile or every mile. Right. Mm. Okay, yeah. It wasn't until Westinghouse and Tesla began to perfect AC power where they were able to generate power for long distances. And that settled the war, what they call the War of the Currents, when in 1896 they were able to use the first generators at, at Niagara Falls to provide power to uh, Buffalo, I think it was, Albany, 25 miles away. Right. And so 
J.P. Morgan decided he was losing money by backing Edison in D.C., kicked Edison out of his own company, changed it to General Electric, and then the grid was really began to form because General Electric had 75% of the market, Westinghouse had 25% of the market, and from then on, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Okay. Now, for people who don't know, so, so direct current, you have to have a, it goes out and it comes back, right? It creates a loop. Well, don't think of it that way because it can go to ground. Think of it instead as a steady voltage is maintained, a steady power, a steady current. Nothing changes. It is direct current. It flows directly to you, and it doesn't cycle. Whereas okay. AC cycles and has multiple phases, yeah. generally three phases. Yep. So the, the voltage is going up and down in a continuous fashion and overlapping by the three phases. Right. So it's, it's a different voltage. It has different characteristics. Right. Have you ever read the book Electric Universe? I have not. I, I'm sorry I don't have the, the author, but I did listen to that book on Audible a okay. little while ago. But uh, it was a very good story about um, Tesla and uh, Edison. I like and the war between the two of them. Yeah, okay. and sort of uh, some, some of the behind the scenes. So I would you know, recommend if anyone there, wants to get to do a deep dive on that, try Electric Universe. There are amazing stunts. Like um, there was a, no one understood the mathematics of electric motors especially AC motors. So they would build them and they would burn out and they wouldn't know why. <laughs> so they would change the design and until it worked, they would, they, now we know it worked, we don't know why. But right. Steinmetz comes along, uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz. He was a character by all stretches of the imagination. He was a genius, he was Prussian, he spoke English in a Prussian accent, he, immigrant, he immigrated here, almost didn't get in. He was a chain smoking hunchback dwarf. Oh nice. Nice. And he worked with Edison later in his life, and so Edison was called the Wizard of Menlo Park. Yeah. Yep. And so now he has a chain-smoking hunchback dwarf with his with, working with him. Nice. You couldn't nice. write it, right? No, no, that's cool. That's awesome. So, this, oh, I, I was going to ask the original, like Jumbo Dynamo and yes. uh, subsequent ones. They were coal. Yes, they, they were. were. They were coal-fired. Coal. Okay. And that plays into why they lost out to AC was because. Uh, they were inefficient coal boilers, whereas if you had a waterfall like Niagara Falls or a very large power plant you could build efficiently, you could generate a lot of power in one place and very cheaply transmit over like, long distances. In fact, the War of the Currents was not won by any of those, those crazy, wonderful, wild stunts. Edison tried to discourage AC's use by saying it was more dangerous. He actually electrocuted stray animals as public demonstrations. Oh, that's right. Did, didn't he electrocute it one an elephant? He had an elephant. It was yeah. declared a rogue elephant, so he demonstrated he electrocuted it. But the uh, one of the things he found out was there were some fatalities resulting from uh, line falls in New York in the blizzard of 1884. And so some dentist by the name of Southwick decided why not execute humans, criminals, via electricity. <laughs> So he yeah. created, he, he approached Edison, and Edison happily helped him design the electric chair, but he made sure he used AC power. Oh, I see. Okay. So he could yeah. blame AC as being more dangerous. Oh, jeez. But and this was how long after they started instituting electrical power that they finally found a way to kill with it? Only eight years. <laughs> way to go. No, electricity is fantastic for killing yeah. people. Or any, yeah, yeah, killing stuff. I'm scared of it. I've, I've been working in it for 55 years. I take, I, I'm very worried when I deal with it. I, I don't do any electrical work. Like I, I'm very minimal. If I'm, if I'm at home, I'll switch out an outlet or yeah. a switch, and only, only if they're standard switches or standard outlets. Like there's three, like the three, three uh, switch, three-way switches. Three-way switch. I'm, mm, I'm a little, little shady on them. Like I don't even like really messing <laughs> with them. If I can pull it out, and it's not like an old house where you've got two brown wires that have, you know, no, like I don't know which, which is which. If they're all like, if it's a, you know, a red and a blue and a green, and mine's got a red and a blue and a green, and I can like just take one off and put it on, I'll do that. But mm. otherwise, I get someone else to yeah, do it. Yeah, you should definitely get someone else to do it. Right. Uh, can we talk real quick, uh, just a, a gloss over it. The reason that uh, uh, a AC is can go further is because we can step up, and we don't have to get into the, the I about, mathematics. I was about to get there. The right. thing that won take the it war, away. The thing that won the War of the Currents was a little teeny, unprepossessing invention. You can find it online. It's no, it's, it, it, beside it, it is on a wooden block. I got a picture on my computer, which I don't have with me. Uh, a little block of wood. It's based on a Faraday principle of, of changing voltage, and it's called the transformer. Yeah. It was invented by William Stanley Jr. And uh, it allowed you to change the voltage because voltage electricity is best generated and used at about 100 volts. Right. But it's best transmitted at the very highest voltage you can because it reduces the current. 
and your losses are based on the current. It's like yeah. a square factor. Right, right. So the, the transformer uh, changed everything because you could, trans, you could generate the electric power at Niagara Falls at 100 volts, step it up to thousands and thousands of volts. Right. A typical line in the United States today that's high powered is 500 kilovolts, 500,000 volts. Ooh. And they have to step it all the way down to about 112, which we use in our houses. But this, this invention was by William Stanley Jr., and who knows him? Right, right. Absolutely. In fact, his, grand, his son's more famous because his son partnered with J.P. Morgan, who I've already mentioned, his right. grandson to form Morgan Stanley. Uh, okay, yeah, we all know who Morgan Stanley Right, right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so when you're talking about generating power, uh, almost... As my understanding is, is that most power plants work the same way, right? It, you you generate heat, you boil water, you make steam, and it spins a turbine. That's that's very true. It, of course, it didn't start that way. Like we started with Niagara Falls. Okay. In fact, the base load generation in the early days of the grid was almost all hydropower. They didn't begin to build coal plants with AC power until they began to run out of sites that were close to where they wanted to generate and, load, and do the power. Coal plants were what they built next, but they were peaking plants. But as the generation rate went from 6 gigawatts to 1,700 gigawatts over the years, they had to start building coal plants, like you're saying. Right. And, and so there's different kinds of coal plants, or different kinds of coal. Uh, you know, you have what they call dirty coal and clean coal. It's all dirty, but <laughs> it's, it's all relative. Like we have anthracite, which is on the East Coast, which is what we have. Because uh, I think Pencil Pennsylvania's big in real they, they were, whether they, how much they still have of it, because it's preferentially mine, because it's the it's higher the quality stuff. Right, right. It's less dirty. Uh, but I think this ties into where I'm going with uh, why uh, nuclear plants, um, in, in the long run, if you look at every factor from, from cradle to grave uh, for energy generation, so what it takes to build a plant, to run a plant, to close down a plant, to all the byproducts, every bit of it. Uh, from my, my research, the a nuclear plant is the cleanest. It's the greenest form of energy we have. You, it, it can certainly be argued very convincingly that you are correct. A baseload coal plant, by definition, let's call a baseload plant something about 1,000 megawatts electric. Right. It, a coal plant that at that size will consume in 24 hours of operation what's called a unit train of coal. That is 100 cars of coal, each carrying 100 tons of coal. 10,000 tons a day of coal get burned in that plant. Jeez. Okay. Wow. And at the end of the day, you still have thousands of tons of stuff that didn't burn. Many of it have contained heavy metals. There have been instances where lakes that were nearby being used by the coal plants to cool, uh, they could not have trout and game fish because of heavy metals like cadmium leaching out of the coal piles and out of the ash piles. Right. So, but you have thousands of tons of stuff left over, fly ash, uh, clinkers, and as well as the coal, because a coal plant generally tries to keep between 90 and uh, 100 days of coal right. near, nearby that it can put in, but each day is 10,000 tons, so do the math. Oh my God. You All have right. large piles of coal. Yeah. Right. So they just load this stuff in with like bulldozers, right? Uh, it's. Or I guess a conveyor system. It's a probably, conveyor yeah, system. Probably, but yeah, yeah. There are stories about those too, but, okay. but basically y you are correct. Now, in, in comparison, a nuclear plant of the same size that operates for an entire year will have approximately maybe a dumpster size of highly radioactive material that has to be disposed of. Right. And so if you only talk about one dumpster for a year rather than 10,000 tons a day, right. uh, you're talking about a very small amount of volume and mass. So one of the solutions is you reprocess it, which we don't do anymore, right? And and then use most of it again, or you you wrap it. You you say you you can vitrify it, but it may put it in a glass matrix. Wrap a metal uh, membrane around it, like put it in a big steel box, and then bury it below the water table someplace in a desert, right? Like Yucca Mountain, and then seal it after you've done that for 50 or 100 years. After you make sure it's stable, and you can show. It will be, um, depending upon the design of the package you put it in, will not be breached by any sort of contamination of groundwater for somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 years. At which point, either we'll, if, if we revert to savagery, who's going to be able to dig down uh, uh, 5,000 feet <laughs> right. to get to it? 
or if we have high technology, we probably will be digging down because we want that material again. Yeah, we'll be able to reuse it. And you maybe use it in technologies we don't even know of now. Right, right. And I know there's some reactors they're talking about now being able to, to burn the fuel and then burn the what's left over of the fuel in a secondary process. Is that right? Well, what you're talking about is uh, refueling and reusing of, of spent fuel in different ways. Right. There are, right now in the United States, traditionally, uh, a plant will use about one-third of the core uh, replace one-third of the core every operating cycle. Now, if the, if the cycle is longer, they might have to replace more of it. But basically, over time, before recent changes in fuel, had extended life cycles, they would replace about one-third of the core every 15 to 18 months, which meant that uh, two-thirds would be used again. Mm -hmm. And then you, the, the last third would be used again. So you would be in there for three cycles until it was no longer deemed useful for the generating of power. Right. So there are some designs now that offer the potential they may be able to burn more of it than historical. E exactly the numbers involved, I don't have at my fingertips. Okay. And we were talking last night, you know, about, um, about Three Mile Island, because that's a big scary thing that happened in the United States. I remember when it happened. I was old, I'm old enough to remember this. Um, and, and it, you know, the movie uh, the, the China Syndrome so, came yes. out. Was that, <clears throat> was that Silkwood? Was it no, that's something? that's a different story. Oh, that's okay. a different uh, whole different that's thing. That's a different cast. That's yeah. Okay, <laughs> but but um, no, this the China Syndrome of Jane Fonda. Yes, and, and I can't remember who the, who the guy was, but basically the 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 plant melts down. The concept is is that the core would get so hot it would burn down through the soil until it hit water or something, then shoot up into the atmosphere and explode and ex you know expose everybody to radiation. Right, is that is that the core concept of that? The core concept, good yeah, pun there. You like that? Oh God! <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> well, let's just say that that was a concern. Right. Uh, the I first of all, the core would have to burn through the reactor vessel, which would not be easy. Right. Would have to burn through the the cement reinforced base mat that's many feet thick in the building itself. Right. And then would have to go down somewhere be below that to find water table. Uh, I don't think that's credible. Right, and some of the designs after Three Mile and involved uh, what's called a corium catcher, okay, which which have various metal objects down there that would capture it. Okay, stuff that is not going to burn through too easily. Correct. Yeah. Uh, personally, just speaking personally now, not right. having don't have analyses at my fingertips. Right, right. I don't find that credible. Okay. Yeah, all right, so because Hollywood, you know, they always get the science right and stuff, right? Always. Yeah, but it scares people. People, they. They'll talk about that as if it's a thing, as if it was something that happened. There was a scientific report that came out, and the government was very concerned about it, and, and it's just not the case. It was a movie. It was a movie, right. <laughs> and it happens all the time. Yeah, movies. San Andreas movies, the movies about the you know, snowpocalypses and right. everything else we <laughs> right. have. Is what about Godzilla? It, it came out of the radiation, right? Right. Hey, Hulk got, came out of radiation. That's one animal. What about all these flying sharks we have? Right. Oh, Sharknado, my God. Right. Yeah. So... so, um, so so power plants have changed over the years. And, oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back to Three Mile Island. So what happened with Three Mile Island? To me, from what I understand, from what I've read, it was a complete success. Like the safety features in it worked exactly like they were supposed to. Well, rather than get really technical about this, right, right, right. and I really could get technical on this one. <laughs> it's one of the things I have studied. Uh, let us just suffice it to say that a relief valve opened at the top of the pressurizer. Now, the pressurizer, already, I'm already in a technical lingo, but a pressurized water reactor keeps the pressure of the reactor cooling system, which is a closed loop. Uh, let me back up. The reactor has fluid going through it called the reactor cooling system. It is a closed loop. That is, it heats the water, the water goes someplace and gets cool again and comes back to the reactor again. It never leaves the reactor. Right. It's going through something that's a boiler, but we call it a steam generator. I don't know why, other than it generates steam, steam, but it also boils them. So yeah. Anyway, we're going to call it a steam generator, and it gets cool there by by touching water that is not pressurized, and so that water then boils and goes off to the gen to the turbine generator, which makes power. The water gets cool. It comes back to the steam generator again, and then it gets heated again in an open loop, more open. It's very similar, just a. a ref refrigeration system, it's just in reverse. 
No. Not going to go there. Okay. <laughs> okay. There. So what we have, in order to keep that pressure high in the primary loop, the reactor coolant loop, there is a, a vessel in there that is kept hotter than the core. Okay. It's Ooh. kept hotter than the core by electric electrodes, very, very strong electrodes, and it keeps a steam bubble in it so that the highest pressure, the highest temp the, the, the steam bubble will always be where the highest temperature is. Okay. And that highest temperature is, is in the pressurizer. Well, the relief valve on the top of the pressurizer is what opened. It opened because of something that happened in the plant. It happens routinely. Okay. However, this relief valve what's called, is called a power operated relief valve. It opens automatically if the conditions uh, say it needs to open, pressure gets too high. But then when the pressure gets low, it closes again. The way it closes is with a spring. The spring broke. Oh, okay. Oh, that would do it. All so right. that did not close. Right. However, the device, the uh, indication on the control panel, erroneous design, only showed whether there was power to the relief valve or not. So there was no power to relief valve anymore. But didn't tell them whether the valve was open or not. Okay. It told them whether it was powered or not because they knew the spring would close it. Right. Only this time, the spring didn't close it. Okay. So the people are looking at their panels and they're seeing that we appear to be losing reactor coolant. We don't know where it's, go where it's coming from, but it's not from the relief valve because the relief valve is closed. Oh. So there was, no, there was no breach in the reactor coolant system other than this valve was stuck open. Computer says everything's fine. Yeah. Must Computer be. says it's fine. <laughs> so <laughs> I have talked to the, op to the operators who were there today, that day that happened. And they wondered if perhaps the relief valve was stuck open. So they, after they thought about it, they walked around to the back panel. And they came across, they encountered another uh, Murphy's Law, which is that the reactor tank, the tank where the, where the, where the water coming out of the relief valve went to, uh, has what's called a diaphragm that breaks when it gets too, too overpressurized and spills water onto the floor of the reactor building. Uh, that diaphragm was located unfortunately right about the place where you'd expect a normal level to be so by the time he got there it had broke so he didn't see any bad level there oh okay so then he went back and says no that's not it. It, it everything's okay if he'd gotten there about two minutes sooner he would have seen that it was not the right level okay if he'd gotten there considerably later he would have seen it was too hot so it had to be steam anyway he right. got there at the wrong moment oh man okay so he goes back to the control room and says it's not there well, where is it, where's it going? What's happening? And the operators didn't understand what was happening. Well, what was happening was the reactor was depressurizing because the pressure was being vented out of the pressurizer. And once the water level got down low enough, uh, so it got below those electrodes I told you about, right. where was now the hottest place in the reactor cooling system? The core? In the core. Right, okay. So where did the bubble form now? Oh, in the core. In the core. Well, that's not good. That's not good. Right. You, need, good. You, need, you want water across the, react, the, the reactor rods to be able to remove the heat. Steam right. doesn't do a very good job. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, heat, and air doesn't do any just even worse job. Right. What is the pressure of the steam in that loop supposed to be normally? Uh, well, the pressure going to the turbine depends on the design of the plant. Maybe 800 to 1,000 pounds. Depends upon what power you're operating at and then what design you're at. Okay. It can be as low as... Six or seven hundred can be as high as a thousand or a thousand fifty. It it very it varies. There's no simple answer to that question. And on on that day when the bubble hit that core, that was probably just going up and up and up too. Well, now the the the, the temperature I just gave you was the temperature of steam going to the turbine. Mm -hmm. You're asking what the temperature of the water was. Well, the water would have to be hotter than that to be able to make the steam that temperature. Right. So, uh, again, it varies by design. Uh, 500 something degrees and we went going higher and higher and of course the, the fuel is rated at much higher than that but it has to be cooled mm -hmm. and so once the coolant was no longer there eventually it, it begins to burst and you have reactor fit you have reactor accident but then they it, they shut it down successfully right I mean they did there, it was shut down this right. was not reactor power heat we're talking about we're talking about decay heat residual heat okay and by the way when I say burst I mean, burst like like pop a little bit. Yeah. Okay. It's just just let some gas out. It's Not still structurally <laughs> there. Right. Yeah, okay. It would be it would in, but hours later they began to melt. Okay. As they could not get cooling back. Okay. And then, so so they shut that down. It's fine. There was no issues. Yeah, there, right? They shut it down. Now let me continue with the accident. Okay. Uh, when they see that what they believe that the level is high, 
because all their instruments in the pressurizer are giving them wrong information because that's where the leak is and they don't right. know it. Right. So this poor, poor man uh, stops the emergency core cooling and throttles it back. As long as he had not touched a device, the core was not going to break because he was still filling with water as fast as it was leaking. But he thought he had to throttle back because of some of the other strange indications he was getting. And when he began throttling back, that's when the water level dropped down mm. to the level of the fuel. Right. And that's when they began to have the rack tax. Okay. So if he would have done nothing, if, he, if everybody would have been asleep in the control room, I'm not, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> no. no. There, there, would have been, there would have been no reactor fuel failure until, they, okay. until so they, they ran out of water. Homer Simpson were running the reactor. It would have been fine. Uh, <laughs> so isn't it wonderful weather we have outside today? Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so, so we've had uh, two other really big failures, and I don't want to go too deep into them, but, uh, you know, everybody knows about Chernobyl, and that yes. was, you're talking, that's one of the oldest reactors that was in operation, right? Now, you, I would say this. It's one of the older Russian designs. Okay. But the Russian designs, um, you got to go back to history here. May I go back to history for a minute? Yep. Please do. The first po actual power generating for useful purposes in the United States can arguably be laid to Hyman G. Rickover, the guy that interviewed me years later to get in the United States Navy in the nuclear power program in the, the program to create a power system for the Nautilus submarines, nuclear submarines. Right. And it would generate power, and they wanted it to, to not have releases because guess what, you're underwater, right. and the crew is gonna be in the ship with you, and then the <laughs> reactor's in the ship with you. Right. And you, so it was, a, it was designed to be very clean, pressurized water reactor. So it was that reactor design that was the basis of scaling up to the power plants we have today. Okay. So they worked, started working from a power plant that was designed less for anything else other than reliability. The, to my knowledge, the, the early Soviet Union designs were, were a scale-up of the systems they used to make isotopes for nuclear weapons. Okay. So they had an entirely different approach to it. They were trying to maximize how much plutonium was being made in the reactor fuel. We had a reactor that did the same thing out in Hanford called the N reactor, but we didn't use that for grid production. Okay. And the civilian plants that built the nuclear plants, Westinghouse, General Electric, Question Engineering, they were scale ups of, in concept of the Nautilus design. So the Soviet reactor that was associated with Chernobyl is the one I'm talking, what we're talking about. Instead of using water as a moderator, which is very easily to, available on a submarine, or any place else, they use graphite Graphite, bricks. right. And as we know, graphite are enormously massive, pure charcoal briquettes. Yes, yes. So when you create a high temperature event, you risk having a fire. Yeah. And that's part of the event at Chernobyl, part of the energy release that allowed them to have such large releases to the atmosphere of the environment. Right. And so, and I also know that the, um, the engineers were underpaid. Like, I think some of those people hadn't been paid, or at least that's what I've read that they hadn't been paid in a long time, so there was, um, they may not have been at full staff. Well, again, um, some of that is speculation in the West and, right. and projecting our feelings of staffing on them. Sure, sure. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go there, mm -hmm. but I will say this, that the, the, the design I was just referring to, it was not, in a United States reactor, we have what's called a negative coefficient of reactivity. If the power level goes up, the fuel naturally wants, the reactor naturally wants to shut down. Right. So it's like negative feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russian reactor design, because of its origins for power for production of isotopes, had a positive feedback. If you increase power, it wanted to go up in power. Okay. So they had elaborate precautions and procedures and things that they obeyed very carefully to make sure they didn't have a transient that became a reactor accident. They violated those. Okay. That's where the problem really was. So right. when the event began, because they, they conducted an experiment outside their specified safety envelope conditions, the accident, the, the event went away from them. Yeah, I, I was telling Mike, I was like, I read somewhere that uh, they were going to do this test, and one of the engineers said, that's not a good idea, and they just went ahead with it anyway. Remember now, we're talking to the people who lived through the event, right. or who died shortly after the event, Right. and so... There have been many books written about this. Sure, and sure. I, and some of them I trust, some of them I don't. Right. But basically, what I just told you is sound. Right, right. I got okay. you. Fair enough. Um, so I just what I'm trying to establish is that 
um, what people have seen as problems with nuclear plants is, you know, the, they're not, that's not common stuff, you know, and, it, and I think there's a, a fear. I, I think it's a little unrational fear. Well, we in, the, we in the nuclear industry feel it is. Yeah. Because, like I said, the basic nucleonic design is to try to have a negative feedback. It tries to damp itself out. The thing doesn't want to have an accident right. by nuclear design, nucleonics. And so we layer upon that level after level of conservatism. For example, I told you last night what the mantra of a nuclear engineer was. Do you remember what I told you? Uh, I don't know. I might have had a couple of The mantra of, of the nuclear engineer is redundancy is good, redundancy is good. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. So we require the NRC requires to have a license that a power plant have a safety train of devices all the way from power plant, all the way from its own source of power, all the way to the device that delivers whatever the safety function is, like water. Mm -hmm. We require it to be able to perform more than 100% of the safety requirement, and then we require them to have another one just like it, or another one of equal capability somewhere else in the plant. Right. So they always have two redundant trains. And we don't, we don't stop there. We then say... We want you to have other systems that are diverse, other diverse aspects that, so you can't have a common cause failure. And then after they do all that, we require them to be able to survive a single active failure during the accident. Right. And then during the recovery phase or during the long-term cooling phase, we require them to have, be able to, made, to survive a single passive failure. An active failure is a pump breaks. Right. A passive failure is a device that doesn't require to do anything like a pipe. It fails. Right. So you have to be able to survive any single active failure anywhere in the plant in the middle of the worst accident and still show nothing happens. Right, right. Very so good. we talked a little bit before we started recording about the generations. And it's, you, you did let us know that it is not clean cut to say, well, this is the first generation. This is the second generation. By generation, you mean generations of nuclear power plant designs. Yes. yes. Uh, so, but where are we around about in the generations of, of what the newest types that are being built and, and proposed four to five five to seven have we reached well again you're, you're, you're talking about arbitrary numbers <laughs> yes and, and, and in many respects we're, we're kind of past that we went through the first I'd say three or four generations okay and, and then those are basically the plants three and four of generation generation three four are basically the plants that are deployed in the grid now maybe five I'll just go ahead and ask my follow up question then okay. and that is what have we learned since then, and to apply what we're building now, as far as redundancy, we know, obviously, yes. redundancy. Are there other things we're also putting in place that, um, you know, your average Joe may not I'm know I'm glad about? you asked that question. <laughs> 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 the newer designs involve a greater reliance on passive devices and passive features, kind of like what I just said before, mm -hmm. where the plant wants to have negative feedback. Uh, we, we, we now, in our design process, really emphasize the plant being able to do things without the operator turning on a pump or without the emergency detection system detecting things. We we really want the plants to take care of themselves so that the operators have more time to be able to decide what to mitigate. In the early design stage, we always wanted the power the reactor operator to be able to have some period of time, 10 seconds to a couple, a minute or 10 minutes where he doesn't do anything. So when he, the one thing we cannot design against is the operator doing the wrong thing. For example, at Three Mile Island, mm -hmm. the plant was not having a reactor accident until that man throttled back the, ah. the core cooling system. Right. He, he took all, he looked in all his answers, all his information, and asked around and made what he thought was the best decision, and it was the wrong, wrong decision. decision. Yeah, you know. Uh, like uh, this comes up in conversations about self-driving cars you know people are afraid of machines they're afraid of machines making decisions because like well I don't want a machine making a decision for me well in a lot of cases I don't want a human making a decision for me because we make mistakes our perception is crap our memory is terrible right we there are things that we do very well this uh, three it, pound it also all depends on the human yeah. who's programming right, sure. that's true the and the sensors that are helping yeah. it make the decision yeah, that but, a human but did those make things go through multiple levels of scrutiny and testing and stuff and once it works once it's automated it does what it does humans far more intelligent than Us. ourselves oh yeah absolutely maybe, maybe like humans Jim. Are yeah. possibly like Jim. almost no, as intelligent no, no, as Jim. No. we do we don't rely on that either in the industry when we when we build a plant or when we when we change a plant that's already built we require them to submit the design change, have the design change made according to various codes and standards, 
And then when it's done, we require it to be checked by two different people. And then once it's done and checked by two different people, they test it. And the test has to match all the, pre all the conditions under which it would operate and then some. And then the test has to be verified and checked. And the test has, anyway, lots of rules and regulations to do to any change or any design change to a plant. And, and I, so I can only it. imagine the tech manuals on this because I, I build prototypes for the Army and I have to do tech manuals from time to time. And I have this one system working on right now. It just transfers halotron gas from a, one container to another. It's like a pump system. My tech manual is this thick for that thing. That's nothing. That's nothing. That's, That's what nothing. I'm saying. But I mean, it's, it's, it's this thick for, for a system that has no electricity, no chemicals. It just runs off an air pump and mechanics. In 1975, when the utility company that I was working for at the time submitted a construction permit request. This is just requesting permit, per, permission to build the plant, not to operate, just to build it. We realized that the amount of paper that we had generated in the application would cover the city of Charlottesville, a uh, city of Charlotte, <laughs> North Carolina, and indeed the plant site, and most of the way out along the transmission line area. That's funny. And the, the NRC today, uh, one of the more recent plants licensed by the NRC is, is South Texas Project. Uh, it is required to keep updated what's called the Updated Final Safety Analysis Report. They have to update it periodically, like every year, every two years. And it, I, I did a page count just recently for an article I wrote, 7,477 pages for that one document. Nice. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, we did one for a tent, and I think it was like 5,000 pages just for assembling a tent. And I want every tent. It was a I big want, tent. I want everyone to pay attention right now. For any time you've ever thought, I just want to do a little small minor change in my house, and you were like, ah, screw getting a permit. Be thankful that there is like the Nuclear Regulation Commission that is, you know, making sure that someone is not just going, ah, we'll just not get worried about a permit. <laughs> but the rule to update the final safety analysis report came out of Three Mile Island. Yeah, okay. What happened was at the op center that I, that I talked about last night when we were talking about something else, at the op center, the NRC and engineers who were trying to figure out what was going on at Three Mile Island realized that the descriptions they were getting from the site were not matching the documents they had on file. Oh my God. And All because right. the plan had been modified since the documents have been filed. Right. And hence came the requirement, you have to update the, the, the documents and keep them updated. They didn't get a permit. The right. job's not done to the paperwork's <laughs> complete. That's true. That's true. So where are, where are we now with building power plants in this, com in this country? I mean, are we, we haven't built one in a long time. Right? We're, building, we're building a couple right now down in, in the south. I think Georgia, Vogel, I believe, is building a couple. Oh, good. Okay, so we're getting back. We're building new nuclear power plants. Well, until it's finished and online. It, right, it doesn't count, right? There have been several nuclear plants along the way that got partially built and not finished. Right. <laughs> or they got built and finished and operated for an hour or two and then got torn back down again. The Be billions of dollars that yes. go into building one of these things. Yes. They Shoreham. Just Shoreham Nuclear Power Plant on Long Island. Now, was this like a, a political thing? Look at the weather outside. It's gorgeous. <laughs> they, okay. it got, Mike, it didn't happen. Okay? It didn't happen. <laughs> wasn't me. Wasn't you. Okay. It wasn't Jim. Jim wasn't had nothing Jim. The weather is still really good right. outside. Right <laughs> it is nice. I mean, it was a little muggy earlier. Right, but, right, but yeah, yeah it's, I think it's... it's, 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 it's this interview goes later. on, it's getting nicer out. <laughs> So um, we may have more references to it as we so, go. So moving on, I, I have an interesting <laughs> question. I hope we'll keep the weather looking nice, um, and that is, what are what is some really interesting? And I'm going to use uh, the word cool, some cool, interesting technology that we wouldn't think of that is going into at least the partial building of many plants these days. That we we hope what if and when they were to <clears throat> go online whenever that would be at the will of whoever, um, that this technology that we wouldn't, we wouldn't think even either exists or is like, oh, wow, I never would have thought of that, like a wow kind of a thing. You understand what I'm asking? Well, do understand that the nuclear industry really would rather have fewer gee wow things than time-tested things. We would really lag, prefer to lag that way. So I really don't have an answer that goes along the gee wow side. But I'll give you I'll give you one. Okay. And and it's not G Wow, it's kinda old. It comes from Three Mile Island. They realized that the operators at nuclear power plants did not have any place really to practice. How do you practice? How do you license operators on a plan? Oh, yeah, that's a good if idea. If you don't have 
something to practice on. Right. Let's so practice on the thing that's kicking out. Yes. <laughs> how, do, how do you practice? So what was happening historically was that very few simulators existed, mm. and the ones that existed didn't really match your plant very well. All right. Like for example, GE might have one, but they were building a lot of GE plants. And, or Westinghouse might have one, but what they have doesn't match it. So they would, when we would license people, we would go into the control room, the real control room, and we would ask them questions, and they would have to point to gauges and what they would do, what they would do, and this is how I would do that. And it became a matter of subjectivity, whether the answers were right, or whether the person would have done mm -hmm. the right thing. It right. became a nightmare just to, for license examiners as well as operators themselves. Well, one of the requirements that came out of Three Mile Island was after some number of years, for them to be able to do it, every plant had to have its own specific simulator. Okay. So on site. So the operators can practice. They can actually do testing on the simulator to see what would happen when a procedure. They would execute draft procedures on the simulator to see how it would work. In fact, if there is an event on the plant they don't really fully understand what happened, they try to run it again on the simulator to be able to see whether or not uh, they can learn things from it. Right. It becomes an enormously powerful training tool. And it becomes, and the sophistication of computers over the years has only made them better and better and better. And the sad part is, I'm I'm sure there's an app for that now right. too. <laughs> the, the thing is, is that now operators can routinely practice the evolutions they're going to be doing, even if they're uncommon ones, long before they do it on the actual power plant. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's a great idea, Mike. So, so Jim, you should work with a software, an app developer, and develop. Nuclear power plant as an app. Uh, I think and, I think there literally I, I, are games I, like that. I did something like this as as an inspector for one power plant. I, I went to test something. I said to them, "I'm going to create an accident or a scenario that at, on the on the simulator that you may not have seen before. I want to see how everybody reacts." And so I, I worked together with the simulator staff who thought it was pretty cool too. I told them we're not grading this, this is just an experiment rather than a, a licensing thing. Once I convinced them of that, we ran this thing and it, it was very, very interesting. Okay. But I got to run it almost like a game on them. Oh, that's <laughs> cool, that's really cool. Yeah, I've, I've been doing some of that at work when developing training stuff, simulator type stuff, so that people can practice on things that you, know, you don't want them to break. But you gotta be able to test it. Because uh, they were training them on this really expensive equipment, and they're messing it up because it was kind of delicate, and and so we built trainers for that. So that's like it's. I think the government is starting to really see the the benefits of these things more and more. And it's, it's, when you say the government, it's really, really important to understand that the stakeholders involved in this are more than just the government as you think of government. When we have uh, one of the things that power plants do is when they have people visiting the power plant, they give them a tour. Mm -hmm. And they can take him into the simulator and say, you want to see what Three Mile Island accident looked like? Okay. They can run the Three Mile Island accident, just load it up. And all the right lights come on, all the flashes, the operators say, invoking procedure this, invoking procedure that, opening this valve, shutting this valve. Or you can say, what happens if you have a loss of grid? What if the grid goes away? How do we, what happens? What, is it, what, what does it look like? Yeah. What, if the, what if the reactor cooling system breaks? Do you have a loss of cooling accident? What does it look like? Right. We can actually run that and show people what's act what the operators are actually looking at and what they're actually doing and watch them do it, watch them cope. Okay. So I, I've, I have a question about the grid. So we, we had a, a problem a number of years ago. I can't remember what it was about, maybe five years ago when, the, when we had a chunk of the grid go down up in the northeast. It's happened a few times. Okay. Well, this, one was, this one was notable because it was pretty bad. Um, there were a couple of those. Yes. Okay. So I know that one of the, the big concerns <clears throat> about the next war, next altercation with certain countries could be an attack on our grid. Yes. And that, to me, that seems very, that seems extreme, extremely scary because we're so power dependent. Um, do you know if, if we're working actively to try and mitigate that sort of attack? I do know that many government agencies have been concerned about that. Okay. And I know that they're various things out there to deal with it. Okay. So uh, I don't claim to be an expert on that. I do say this, that the United States has developed, is divided into, I believe, seven different uh, areas that are themselves linked together, but they're not, it's not one grid. Okay. There are like seven grids that are all linked together. Are we talking like nodal, similar to the internet? No, like, like, infrastructure? like, like, like Texas might be one. 
or there might be five or six states in the Northeast that are one. Okay. And so they're, they're, they have tie connections between the two of them. So there's a, a, the, there's a chance that if you took one of those seven down, it could come back via power being fed by another six eventually. Okay. Recovered. Nuclear power plants have their own on-site power sources, so the idea is the plant might go off the grid, but it might be able to be kept stable, and when the grid's ready to take the power again, it can be brought back onto the grid again. Okay. And in coal plants, of course, it just takes how long it takes to put the, bring the coal plant up, all that stuff, hydro plants. Also, the proliferation of DC devices. We have a lot of people that live off the grid anyway, right. or, they have, or they have your own PV ups, up on your roof, mm -hmm. and you can sometimes power a lot of your things on your own for a while right and and i think it's where it's going i i you know elon musk is pushing those new those tiles i don't know how well they work but i know he was talking about it the the roof tiles that are solar panels and you know feeding his tesla batteries and again i don't i don't know how well this stuff works but do you understand that that many people are calling this war of the currents too good i'm fine with it you know i mean because the winner will be us I agree with that completely. Yeah. The winner will be us. And I, I really, I like the idea of the ceiling, the, the roof tiles, because he said that when, you're, when your house is falling down and rotting away, those tiles will still be good. Like, they'll outlive your house. So they become your roof <clears throat> tiles. So you just, you pay for an, a very expensive roof, but you're getting a roof out of it, too, and power. Um, what do you, do you, have you done any kind of studies or read any, anything about these? Do you uh, like what I have doing? not, but the, the idea of having greater individual reliance and not needing the grid has got to be good. It's got to be. Yeah, I agree. Totally agree. Um, now, are, the, are there any concerns with the batteries? Because I know when you're storing a lot of energy in one place, you have a potential for that energy to escape into what they call a fire or an explosion. Or, or, or what's called an energetic event. Right, or, energetic or what, event. Was That's it an called, uncontrolled yes. Burn of or something. Well, no batteries. I mean, like, like the phones. Like your your favorite Galaxy Note had that issue. It was it, that was all from the battery because you're storing a lot of power and mm -hmm. a lot of energy in one place. The, in the nuclear power, the the worst case accident is called um, an uncontrolled release of fission products to the atmosphere. When I was on my ship back in the engine room with turbine was, they said, "Don't listen to that anymore. That's not the worst accident. Back here, the worst accident is an unreleased a." an uncontrolled release of turbine blades to the atmosphere. Because these things are rotating at 1800 RPM, they're very large and massive, they're basically uh, spears being thrown, very large objects. So now you have an uncontrolled release of battery power to the, right. to the environment. So yes, stored energy makes me nervous. Yeah. But do, you, do you like standing below a dam? Think of the stored energy there. Yeah, right. Do you like standing next to a bomb? There's no. stored energy in there. Right, right. When I, when I mow the lawn, I use an electric lawnmower that plugs in because when I, if I want to deal with something that might be caught in the blades, I want to unplug it and know there's no stored energy that might move the blade when I don't want it to. Right, right. Yeah, but you gas know, gives you much more cause, satisfaction cause and you power. Know, uh, maybe give you more satisfaction about it. Cause, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know how many people know this, but like when you're in your neighborhood and a storm's <clears throat> coming through and all of a sudden you lose power, a lot of time that's a transformer blowing up. It doesn't have to be a storm. It can be any time. But a lot of transformers will blow up. And well, they trip, right? Because the no, transformers no, no. They are made to... They literally explode. Some, well, some do, some do, some don't, yes. There's, when you say explode, it's, it's, a, it's how the transformer is built. They may have a rupture of, the, of an area where the coolant is. They, yeah, yeah, because it gets real hot or something like that. Or you might have a, a spike where there's so much energy in a particular place that it creates localized boiling and it exceeds the pressure and it, it pops the little reservoir. Yes. I mean, I've, I've been actually, I was standing, we were, we were eating uh, a, uh, Italian ice at, this, at one of these Rita's. Uh, and one went off above us, and because we had the uh, umbrella over top of us, we're sitting under it. All the the shower of sparks bounced off of it. That might have been cool to see. It did, was did cool. Did you get a video of that? No, I didn't. I, I know we were sitting there eating. All of a sudden, boosh! And my daughter started screaming, right? Because she was like four. I just snatched her up and ran away from it. Um, but it, it was just it was it was pretty cool though. I mean, other than my daughter screaming her head off, it was pretty cool. But. Um, you know, so that's again that's stored energy. That's why I'm a little I'm a little sketchy on putting one of those batteries in my house. Yet. Well, there's there's another piece of the puzzle which I mentioned to you when we started that it started with elephants, but I mentioned before we got on camera that we have a duck problem now. Okay. Did I mention the duck, the threatening duck? No. What? California Independent Service Organization in um, some years ago realized, um, 2003 maybe, that they had a problem because of the large penetration of their part of the grid by. Photovoltaic and wind. 
Mm -hmm. And that was because uh, if you if you spend all the money that takes to build a lot of solar power and a lot of wind power, uh, you put a lot of money into it, but you've already spent it. So when it's actually operating, fuel's free. So the marginal cost today of something that's like photovoltaic is essentially zero. Right. It means it's the cheapest source of power to the grid. So if you have a lot of these power plants, when the sun comes up and the sun gets bright on this and they generate a lot of power, they are the cheapest power. They will push off the grid anything that's more expensive to generate. So and it will fluctuate during the day. If clouds come over, you could find periods of time where it fluctuates so bad and you get so bright that the, the amount of power, the amount you can sell the power for becomes negative. Oh, you have God. to pay somebody to take it. <laughs> oh, so Great. you... Hmm. That's if you're keeping other power sources online. So if you drive them off, uh, they, have this, they have this picture. You can look it up online. Uh, the picture shows that the power being generated that's not being, that does, I'm, 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 let me define my parameters carefully. The, the graph shows the power that is being generated and being supplied to loads that does not involve renewable power, renew, photovoltaic and wind in this case. And so as soon as the wind picks up and the sun comes up, it dives because more and more of the power is being supplied by photovoltaic. And it gets lower and lower and bottoms out around midday, as you would expect. Right. And then when night falls, all of a sudden, it all goes away. Yeah. They have to find 13,000 megawatts of power to replace it in three hours. Okay. So where do you find the power? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Throw one yeah. of them plants you, online, you, maybe? Well, if you do... A bunch of hamsters running away. Well, yeah. <laughs> if you have all those batteries we're talking about, it turns out this phenomenon actually ends, ends up in some places leading to higher releases of carbon. Because in Germany, the amount of carbon that was released actually went up in 2015 because of the greater reliance on wind and photovoltaic. <laughs> because they were bringing these cheap, easier to bring on coal plants and, and, turbine, and gas turbines that were very inefficient, releasing stuff to the atmosphere. When before they had been using nuclear and larger plants that were more efficient and more, shall we say, friendly to the environment to operate. Right. So right. You, your challenge is from photovoltaic and wind. So it, it, always, it, it always comes down to the same damn thing I say all the time. There are no simple solutions to complex problems. Just it's not a thing. So people say, oh, we'll just go all to solar. It's like that's a complex. You're talking about a very com energy supply is an extremely complex problem. And you're not just going to go, eh, we'll just do this. Well, we're at a science fiction convention, are we not? Yeah, we are. One of the key science fiction writers is Robert A. Heinlein. He uses an expression called, well, if you say it, it's called Tan Stoffel. Okay. It stands for, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Right, yep, absolutely. And that yep. applies to the grid. It does, it does. So, all right, before we go, because we're running a little bit low, we're running, time's coming up. Um, you did some research on on antimatter. I and, did. And uh, well, uh, what was the other one? Um, so heavy water, space, space, space power space. systems. So talk a little bit about what you found out about those. Well, it's not so much research as reading up on what pictures and videos can do that as well. Sure. But basically, in space, in space based power, you cannot use a steam cycle. Right. So they have their reactors have other uh, other ways of doing it, but they're inefficient. But they, depending upon which method it is, you can get between 10 and 20 percent of the power you generate. You can use the rest of it. You got to have as radiators that radiate away. So these power, these probes that are talking about using nuclear reactors, just look like big telephone poles with sails on them. With the tip <laughs> of it's the reactor, okay. and, and the rest, almost all the rest of the probe is the sail to get rid of the heat. Right. Right. So, but they work. They would be efficient, and they, you would be useful to have them where the, you can't use solar sails very well. Okay. And if I were ever going to be on a colony on Mars, I don't want to rely on solar power because they have no. dust storms. Right. And the solar power, I want a nuclear reactor with me, thank right. you. And the sun is putting out a, a lot less power on Mars. Well, yeah, it drops I mean, off with distance, It's not yes. putting it out less. It's putting out as much. You're just not receiving as much on Mars. And it goes down with the square, obviously, the further we get away. Yeah, yeah. So Which means maybe we should colonize the atmosphere of Venus because it'd be even more there. Yeah, well. It's closer to the sun. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think Venus is going to be a possibility. Not to land on it, but you can maybe do it in the atmosphere. Yeah, they were talking about, well, I don't want to go off topic too much, but that's another discussion about, about colonizing Venus in its atmosphere with balloons and but stuff. But by the way, if you're going to have a moon colony, you know what the solar is going to be. Right. You don't have to worry about dust storms or... Yeah, that's true. That's true. I often said, 
It would, so you know you got all these meteors that that hit the moon all the time, or meteorites, or meteoroids. What is it? What is it when it hits? A rock. A rock. Okay. Meteorite. So you got these rocks hitting the moon. Uh, and so there's no atmosphere to stop it, but there's still gravity to pull it in. Yes. And if you're on the surface and you get pounced by one of these things, you're done. So I was I always thought they should they should build uh, build it in like some of the they still have some. Um, caves and stuff on the moon yes you build that in there and you run your your solar power in from outside i agree i think that's the way it you'd want to be deep down anyway to get away from uh, radiation, radiation solar, and, solar yeah. and uh, cosmic radiation right. right right one last question and i'm going to challenge you and i know you're going to look at me you're going to give me that look because I, 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 have I'll i given you that look so far i'll once? probably deserve it all right I'll, i'm going to use one word and all i want you to do in a few sentences as possible is tell us what the prognosis is the word Cold fusion. What is the prognosis for cold fusion in, in the near 20 years? Uh, I don't need a word. How about this? All right. You heard it here first. Yeah. yeah. I don't have much faith in cold fusion. You think? No. No. Right. Okay. Okay. Because it's, it's what is it, 50 years off every year? No, you're talking about fusion in general. Yeah. Well, fusion and... Oh, oh wait. Okay. So cold fusion. Right, He's talking that's, cold yeah. fusion. Right, right. That's two different things. You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. So what about, what about fusion itself? Well... Fusion has got, it turns out stars are really good at fusing. Yeah, they are. Because, yeah. But they have this enormous amount of mass, mass to make gravity. Right, yeah, yeah. Right. And we have to somehow replace that. And the, the two major ways are to, that have been explored extensively to date is by using some kind of uh, uh, magnetic containment and increasing the pressure. And the other one is by bombarding a fuel pellet with uh, a great many laser beams at the same time and having it implode and create a pressure pulse in the center of the fuel pellet. Right. Um, I don't like their chances. Right. But okay. uh, the, uh, the closest thing I have right now that's coming close to operational is the ITER in France. And they don't think they're going to be able to generate net positive power. But they consider themselves to be the next step towards it. What, right. they're, they're getting 80 to 90 right now? Uh, close? I, the design changes, so I can't okay. tell you. Okay. And so, until they actually do it, I don't know. So I think, I think they should keep pursuing it. I don't think there's anything wrong with pursuing it, but I think if we're looking for a solution, uh, I, I say stop. You know, stop uh, getting away from nuclear. We need nuclear. Uh, we do need nuclear, but I, and I agree with you. Fusion is con worth continuing to research and work on and spend and money on. What are our top five? So fusion, and, and our other top four. Would you say that we really need to pursue? Well, if you feel you're going to run out of either thorium or uranium, then you would want to use a breeder reactor design, which, which tends to make more fuel than you use. By converting other isotopes, which you can't use for fuel, into isotopes, you can use for fuel. Wow. Okay. okay. And so are we building any of those? Are we? No. No. Okay. No, uh, we, too, we, the, we the weather's too nice outside. It is wonderful weather out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have built them. Okay. We have built them. Oh, okay. but we have not in operation. Uh, no. Okay. But it, it's something that those are... Good reactors in concept, you, at least. Yes, you can you can generate power with them, and there's nothing wrong with them other than they're nuclear reactors. Right, right, All right. But okay. that still is a nuclear. So are we talking uh, solar? That's something we definitely want to keep yes. pursuing. We want to talk wind. Yes. Uh, what are what are what are your other top good. two? Geothermal is good, okay. but you got to be in the right place for that, right? You can't you, just have that anywhere. You do correct. Now, do understand that in many places at a house, you can get the equivalent of geothermal by drilling down very far in your own house and using the, the, the local heat to be able to generate, mm -hmm. reduce your cost. Yeah. That's always good if you can do yeah, that. that. Right. But that's expensive mm -hmm. as all get out. Yeah, but the payback's not too bad, depending on where you are. Right, right. Don't dismiss it out of hand. Don't diss it out of hand. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Like, I'm saying certain locations are better for it than others. Like, for example, if you're living in Hawaii, geothermal is a good... Now, you're talking about power generation and yeah. hot water. I'm talking about just simply helping to heat and cool your house. You okay. can get down deep enough to be able to get at 55 degrees. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that's not too deep. Yeah. Can that helps you in cooling, it helps you in heating. Right, because if you're only trying to raise 55 degrees to the comfortable 70 that you would like, that's better than the outside 20 to negative 20 degrees. And getting that up to 70. Right, mm -hmm. getting that up to correct. 70. All correct. Now, uh, do understand if you happen to be a condo on the third floor, it's probably not an option. Right, right. Okay. All right, excellent. So, so Jim, where can we find your stuff? I know Bain, right? Bain.com. They have published several of my science articles online. Uh, and uh, 
One of them involves atomic follies, which maybe we'll have another podcast on. Right, right. And uh, I can be found on the web. That's about it. I don't have a website. Okay. All right. Hey, hey, we'll have to have you come back. you have to come back and talk about atomic follies. We'll do a whole show on that. That would be fun. We're going to – strange things we tried to do with nuclear power. <laughs> We're going to try and convince uh, Jim to come back. Maybe we'll get him set up online. He was like, I want to do this here right, so that can... I don't have to get on that, that blasted computer. <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna get you all taken care of. It's gonna be easy. Computers are really for games and communication. Yeah, well, we, we do a pretty good job communicating with it. Uh, yeah. So, so anyway, thanks. Go check out Jim's stuff. Absolutely. And hold on, let me do the thing, right, Mike? The, the, this and that and the. All right. So you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits live from Balticon. Uh, we're, we're also normally live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions or just banter with the other Mythfits. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook, on YouTube. Find us at Mythwits.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as Mythwits. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. And make sure to share your favorite episode on social media. This is a good one. This is a good one. Yep. Yeah. Um, Make sure to oh, help spread the love of Mythwits over the entire planet. Uh, Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't sell it, and don't mix it with heavy water for a refreshing summer drink. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows. And make sure to check out our parent company, Aetherforge.com, for more cool stuff. And join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike... Don't!